Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is actor, screenwriter, and now director Alice Lowe, whom you may know from Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, Beehive, and Horrible Histories, or Hot Fuzz, The World's End, and Paddington. And of course, there's Ben Wheatley's Sightseers, in which she and co-writer Steve Oram wander through the Peak District, wreaking some very polite havoc. She's bringing her feature debut, Prevenge, to the Toronto International Film Festival on Monday, September 12th, and I've been sitting on this episode since we recorded it at her London flat back in March. Alice chose Labyrinth, or maybe it chose her. David Bowie's death was still hanging over England like a pall when I was there, and she'd live-tweeted a recent TV broadcast of Jim Henson's creepily metaphorical 1985 fairy tale in which Jennifer Connelly plays a slightly too old teenage girl drawn into a world of menacing fantasy by Bowie's capering codpiece Goblin King. And, of course, that led me to begging her to talk about it on an episode of this show. Alice was not only up for it, but wonderfully thoughtful and insightful, bringing both the perspective of an Englishwoman who grew up with Bowie and the Muppets as Constance, and the emotional range of a very perceptive artist. I'm really happy we got to talk, and if you listen carefully, or not so carefully, you'll hear a cameo appearance from one of her Prevenge co-stars in the background. This is someone else's movie. I was tempted to pick a film that would make me seem very um, clever in an obscure way and I was thinking what's the most obscure interesting film that I could pick um, and I'd already sort of live tweeted Labyrinth um, which is how I decided that I had to have that yeah exactly I was exactly. really hoping you'd pick it yeah, so I you never saying, influenced you, I never pushed but it was just like yeah you were like do you fancy maybe doing Labyrinth and, and I was like oh well, I should choose something a lot more grown up and um, pretentious than that <laughs> and then I thought you know what the hell I also think because of in the light of recent events which is why they were showing Labyrinth on TV in the first place um, I kind of thought oh it's really timely um but also, you know, you shouldn't be sort of ashamed of your early influences, I think. Like, as I said, I think it's sort of part of my creative DNA. I can't get away from that film. I actually think it's hugely underrated as well in terms of the script and the structure and the really unusual content of that film, you know. Yeah. Um, the female character, I think, is really interesting and really unusual, Um, Company of Wolves is another of my really favourite films Uh from childhood and I think there was something in that film that as a a young girl I knew there was something slightly dangerous about it I don't know if it would get made now because people would be like you can't have a 17 year old girl having a relationship with a man in his 40s and seeming to be condoning that in a kid's film but I actually think that was one of the things that made it so powerful and interesting and and about that threshold of, of becoming a woman and, and adulthood and, and what's so terrifying about it. Yeah. I, I hadn't seen it in, I would say, 20 years, maybe mm. yeah, 15, but really? it's been a long time. I think the first time it was released on DVD was the last time I had seen it, and then I watched it again for this, and it's, yeah, it's <laughs> much more adult than I remember. Mm, yeah. It's also much less, it is structured, but it's less structured than I remember. Right, yeah. Uh, I remember, I I put it together in my head as a much faster paced film and it really Mm. does wander around that labyrinth an awful lot. And 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 once it's the Battle of the Stones, I lose interest every time. I'm sort of like, I'll put the kettle on during this bit and come back (laughs) for the ending, you know, with the amazing Escher stuff. But yeah, Yeah. you know, uh, it's it's sort of got a horror structure to it, really. Mm. Sort of slightly Hellraiser, you know, someone, a young girl kind of, um, wishing for something she shouldn't shouldn't do and yeah. opening a Pandora's box, really. Yeah. And being and, forced to do it, yeah. which is the other thing, too. It's not yeah. that I didn't want this, I want to leave. Yeah. But she, I mean, the whole point of Labyrinth is that she is given, repeatedly in the first ten minutes, she's given the opportunity to not do this thing. Yeah. Um, so what you're dealing with is uh, a very strange bargain where Jareth the Goblin King offers to take her memories of her brother away. Mm. And presumably, and as we see from all the other goblins, this happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and and it's a really strange 
now, I mean, the resonances are, are just even more disturbing because mm. I'm sitting there thinking he's basically offering to roofie her. No, well, <laughs> it's consensual, so that's not it. But then later there's another thing where the, the female lead, who is a child, really, mm. or has to be just enough of a child that we can believe this whole thing. You know, if, if yeah. she was a little older, it wouldn't work. If she was a little younger, it would be too terrifying. Yeah. Uh, and Connolly, who you know, famously went through puberty during the film because mm. her costumes change and the shape of her face changes. Mm. You actually see her grow up mm. and then get younger again because they shot out the sequence. <laughs> it, it's it's a really weird place to have that decision put on that character mm. because now suddenly we're watching, you know, she was, she was this frivolous teenager jumping around mm. and now suddenly she has to decide whether or not to give up a baby and mm. there, the metaphor there is weird yeah. and the the allegorical aspects of it it just gets stranger and more complicated yeah it's a very unusual sort of fairy tale in that respect um but for me i mean i i watched that beginning bit and i said this on twitter as well and i just go that was me <laughs> and it represented me like this nerdy girl I was sort of obsessed with pre-Raphaelite pictures and paintings and um and I uh, also Anne of Green Gables is okay. like a, a sort of thing that, a character that I loved at that age because she was pretentious I actually think it's brilliant comedy Anne of Green Gables she's a brilliant comic character and she's not often seen as such she's no, very, very seen as being a bit twee and whatever but I loved it at the time um and it was this this sort of pathos of of kind of trying to achieve your dreams, and the reality is a lot more boring and banal. And I think my comedy and my sort of comic instincts revolve around that kind of dichotomy a lot about someone who has dreams, but they keep being thwarted sure. by their own pathetic failure, yeah. basically. So to me, that was that was the that's what she's dealing with at the beginning of the film and then the fact that someone is offering her her dreams to be realized and to be successful um but it's sort of a dangerous offer Mm -hmm. um i think that's really fascinating because i think the background when i watch it now i sort of think Okay, but what else does she have to do? Like, yeah. well, just, that party's not gonna, <laughs> that party's not going to last forever. Is she just going to be home. in a bubble, wearing a dress, sort of dancing with lots of masks, or does she actually have to like pay him some sexual favors? Mm. I think she probably does I have to. Applied. I think that's a given. Um, and then you go, that is really dark, but that is the 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 decision that you're offered as a teenage girl, and you know, there's so much sort of debate about this. At the moment, you know, with the age of consent and all of this, this is really dark what we're going into now. But, you know, in the newspaper that in the UK, there's a footballer who's going to prison because, I just saw something about that, yeah. you know, he had a relationship with a 15-year-old girl. And as a, as a 15-year-old girl, what what you understand to mean about sex is, is nothing. You don't understand it. And that's the whole Little Red Riding Hood thing is there can be a very attractive proposition to you that you think someone's really interested in you and that they are in love with you, but you don't understand what the dark side of that is. You don't understand what bargain you're entering into. Yeah. And I think there's an inherent understanding of that as a child when you watch Labyrinth, you know that this figure is dangerous, but you don't quite know why. You don't quite know what is going to happen to this character. You just know that she shouldn't do it. Yeah. But there is an attraction there as well, and I think that sort it sort of encapsulates something really interesting that is very, very difficult to um, translate in a narrative without it seeming like you're condoning, yeah. you know, underage sex or whatever mm. or goblin sex. Underage yeah, goblin go- sex. Go- I mean, underage, yeah. Keep it fantastical. I think we're safe. Yeah, yeah. But goblins. It, but, yeah, but I would love goblin cod pieces. <laughs> well, that's what I was about to say because. <laughs> The film does not let you. I mean, there's a key light. There's mm. lighting choices that pre- that present yeah. Bowie's costume in certain ways. I would love it's to get somebody sweet, like you know Todd Haynes to do a semiotic reading of it and actually mm. explain what each image means in yeah. contrast. Because when you get to the, I mean, you you introduce Bowie as this 
stately, regal, almost unemotional figure. His mm. line readings, I, I have not remembered how He's flat kind they are. kind of a are. male ice queen, isn't he? Yeah. Like the snow queen or something like that. A little Tilda Swinton, yeah. Yeah. And how, how intentional that is, because it's not, you know, he was, was not a bad actor. There's mm. no way he's not doing this on purpose. Yeah. And, you know, just his initial, hello, Sarah, <laughs> almost mechanical. It's, an, yeah. it's a really strange choice. And yeah. then he becomes warmer. But yes, not, you, know, you start to feel sorry for him as yeah. the time goes on, which just made me fall in love with him even more. I mean, it's got a lot to answer for, that film, in terms <laughs> of, like, women choosing their, you know, people that they choose to fall in love with. I've got a friend who wrote a very interesting book about female heroines and, and how things like Wuthering Heights really screw you up in terms of, you know people search for Heathcliff sure, yeah. <laughs> when they should be going nowhere near Heathcliff. Yeah, the beautifully broken man. Yeah, exactly. And that is the Jareth sort of archetype, isn't it? That you, you know, you see a glimmer of humanity and you think, oh, I could save him. I could change yeah. him. <laughs> He'd be a really nice goblin king if I, if I got my hands on him. Yeah. <laughs> it's all depressing in, in those terms. It is remarkable, though. I mean, you, you have a character who is the villain, mm. who is an interesting villain. Mm. I mean, traditionally, that's what makes na- liter- narrative and literature, that what's, that's what makes stories interesting, when yeah. the villain is also intriguing. Yeah. But by casting Bowie and by having him sing constantly in you know non-diegetic terms, those songs aren't being performed for the most part yeah, by I've the never, characters. I've never thought about that, that Sarah never sings a song. It's just mm-hmm. him singing. That is really strange, isn't it? For a musical, yeah. you're essentially going... Well, we've cast Bowie as the lead, so should we just put some songs in it? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was what their decision I just, was. I assume the studio said, you know, you have him, you make him sing. <laughs> put him <laughs> make in Make him He's work. He's willing to work with you, you do it. And, <laughs> and the screenplay's by Terry Jones, who mm. I always forget that. I, I met him last year, and it's just one oh, of those really? things where it just goes right through your head. It's like, well, oh, yeah, he also he's, did that. he's not that sort of proud of that work and I, I just think if I met him I would sort of say to him you know that really had an impact on me that film in a, in a positive way there's no way that loads of people don't think that that's an incredible piece of work you know mm. in, and lots of people have been influenced by it but I, you know I think it's something interesting I think it must be connected to the Henson sort of legacy that they were creatively allowed to just get on with what they wanted to do. Mm. And I suppose once you've got Bowie in the mix, you've got Terry Jones in the mix, that whoever was producing it just went, do whatever you want. And 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 also I think Henson had a very sort of interesting approach to childhood and a non-infantilising yeah. of childhood. You know, um, it's kind of this 70s ethos of, you know, maybe let those things that are slightly scary and dangerous and weird, just let them exist because that's what childhood is. And so many children's films now get rid of any element of danger or fear. And I I think it's really interesting because, you know, we had a midwife come around. I've got a two-month-old baby who may make an appearance um, audially at any point. (laughs) Um, But, you know, we had a midwife come around and look at our flat and she was like, oh, that's a scary picture. Because we've got loads of horror posters mm. everywhere on our flat. And, and I was like, oh, am I a terrible mother? Should I be putting all these horror pictures away? But then I actually thought, no, that's, you know, that that's our environment. That's us. You know, yeah. the child's going to grow up with us as parents. And... You're going to have a cool kid. Yeah. Because she won't be afraid of the monsters. She'll yeah, be into or it. even if she is, that's part of growing up. You know, a lot of these films terrified me. The Dark Crystal mm-hmm. absolutely terrified me when those Skeksis did their weird noises and when the Emperor died. I'm a massive Henson fan, by the way. Yes. Um, you know, it te- I was sort of hiding behind my hands in the cinema. Um, but I think that's good for you. I mean, you're not actually going to die. It, you know, that's the next best thing is is being exposed to things that frighten you that aren't actually a threat. Yeah. Surely yeah. that's how you learn about fear in the in the best possible way, rather than it being from a real threat in your your own environment. Yeah, I mean, it's much more therapeutic to have the catharsis of a horror film or even just a an action movie, something that that gets your pulse racing and then brings it down again, mm. than it is to escape a monster, mm. like a, to encounter something awful in real life is yeah. actually genuinely traumatic yeah um labyrinth i don't know if it has anything truly traumatic for kids and the dark crystal is definitely a harder film Mm. um, in terms of its fantasy world and its and its violence Mm. but 
Labyrinth, I think, will just make you question the funny feelings that you get from things happening mm. in the movie, which is so, which is almost better and almost worse at the same time. There's yeah. so much going on in it subtextually that that yeah, a ten year old would be shaped in different directions, bounce back and forth like a pinball yeah. during the film. Yeah, I think actually the bit that disturbed me most was almost the dream sequence i was kind of going this is like eyes wide shut or something it really is (laughs) that was what i thought too watching it and and i think when you had said that you know like the film seems to acknowledge the darker bargain Mm. um those masks are grotesque yes they're really unpleasant and the fact that you know that um the people look beautiful because they're wearing their gowns and they look like they may be beautiful under the masks Mm. you know that they are actually the goblins but in human form and that's more creepy than anything in a yeah. way. And that and also it's like a it's a it's a trip. She's on a kind of trip, oh, really. Yeah. Um she's peach just trip. eaten this weird peach that's, you know, been laced with something. So all of that stuff suddenly as an adult seemed really strange. Whereas as a, as a child I was just entranced by that. I okay. was kind of like, Oh, I love this bit with the bubble. And, you know, part of me does go and a lot of people were saying this on Twitter as well, like, take the bargain, <laughs> just take the bargain. <laughs> you've got bubbles, you've got really nice dress, you've got Bowie, yeah. you've got a massive castle. What is the problem? I mean, you're basically the Kim Kardashian yeah. of the 80s. Yes. <laughs> just enjoy it. Just enjoy the wealth that being a goblin queen will bring you. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so part of me watching it, I'm like, yeah, go for it. But... But underneath it all is the bog of eternal stench. Yes, and that's true. I think that's true. really quite telling. That it's directly under them all the time. Yeah, and the whole place probably does stink. And does does Bowie even look like that in real life? He might be using some sort of magic. That's true. To make him look the way he does. Yeah. You don't know what the cod piece contains. It yes. might be... <laughs> More goblin. Yeah. <laughs> Way more goblin. No, Just no, a goblin taken, face. I've taken it It might be later. another face. Yeah. I think I've seen that movie. Um... <laughs> But this, and this is the thing, too, that we haven't pointed out yet, which is that Jennifer Connelly, after the initial prologue, Jennifer Connelly and David Bowie are the only human beings. Mm. Everything else is a Henson puppet and a particularly gooey, slimy, warty, mm. um, unpleasant-looking Brian yeah. Froud design. They're, yes. all, they're all very warty. <laughs> well, this, this is what I wonder about the uh, the cod piece as well, because in our days of CGI, and this is like a, a debate that constantly rages, and, uh, you know, is there as much artistry with CGI? Mm. And I think that the cod piece survived because you had an artist designing everything. So everything had that bespoke, crazy, you know, look yeah. to it, that esoteric design, that Arthur Rackham kind of um, look to it, which I absolutely love. But you don't get films like that anymore. I mean, I, I quite enjoyed uh, Maleficent. Oh, yeah. Um, just because I was like, oh, someone's trying to make a kind of, you know, dark fairy tale film. And, you know, I, I love legend. I love, you know, as I said, Dark Crystal. Um, but I didn't think the creatures were up to scratch. They were all sort of CGI'd and they didn't seem to belong to the same world as Angelina Jolie's costumes yeah. and stuff. It's strange. There is a tactility that's been sacrificed, I think. I mean, very mm. quickly sacrificed. You saw, well, Mad Max just won the costume design Oscar yeah. last week, and yeah. it's all handmade, all yeah. repurposed. Um, and the, all the effects as well, yeah. you know. And there's a, there is a, a love of texture in mm. that film that you really do want to just reach out and join that world, even though it's horrible and everyone's dying of, yeah. of radiation poisoning. It's just beautiful and glorious. Mm. And, and Miller came through a Toronto on a, on the press tour, and, and he would said that, you know, everything. The rule was that there could be no a there could be no new stuff, mm. and b everything had to have two purposes. Everything had to have been repurposed from what it was originally wow. as they rebuilt the world. So, yeah. Max's mask at the beginning is a garden sp- a trowel, yeah. just been hammered together with two wow. other things. And I mean, the it's whole amazing. Like it, uh, she so deserved the Oscar, Jenny Bevan. Like, oh, yeah. just incredible the artistry, and I just. I found it so exhilarating to watch that film, uh, you know, and it was like a visual treat, like on the screen, part, you know, I was like, we have to go and see it again because yeah. there are bits of the screen that I wasn't looking at and yes. I want to look at next time. Yeah. And yeah, it is, it is similar in that way of like, you can rewatch Labyrinth or you can rewatch The Dark Crystal and there'll be things in it that you didn't see before. And things that will have surprised them as they were making it as well. That's the thing about ha- having everything 
in camera mm-hmm. is you go, oh, I didn't know that was, I didn't know what the physics of that puppet was going to be. I didn't know it was going to move like that. I didn't know it was going to look like that. I didn't know that thing was going to do that when it smiled, you know. Yeah. Well, I think of Ludo's gum line, which is so weirdly detailed, which I had <laughs> never noticed before, but they're really, they put that in there. They gave him an underbite and some kind of a, an upper plate thing yeah. going on. Yeah. But, yeah, and it's as a, a child, you just go, well, it's real. Yeah. And I remember, I, you know, I so wanted more Labyrinth. I didn't want the film to finish every mm. time I watched it. I think that's a, a mark of a, a, a brilliant film when you just want it to have a different ending. You want, you know, her to stay in the Labyrinth. Uh, and every time you're watching it, it's because you want to get back into that world. And I just wanted more. I wanted more Labyrinth. So I watched, like, the making of documentary, thinking, like many children thought, I want to work for Jim Henson. Right. I want to be part of the Jim Henson workshop. And I remember watching it and it's sort of distressing me because I was like, they're not real. <laughs> the puppets aren't real. They're showing how they're made. They're made out of like wires and, you know, airbags and stuff like that. And I was like, no, I, no, I, I couldn't ever work for them because yeah. the you magic wouldn't that, be real. Yeah, you don't want that illusion shattered. The... Um... I have uh, <laughs> I have interviewed Kermit twice. Really? Yeah, once oh, on the I'm phone, jealous. which is the most surreal thing I've ever done. Wow! Uh, and it was after Henson's death, unfortunately, it was Steve Whitmire doing the work, who's, mm. who's a puppeteer, but not a voice in in Labyrinth, as it turned out. The voices right. were supplied by different people yeah. than, the, than the Muppet puppeteers. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that until this time around. Mm. Um, but. Yeah, interviewing Kermit on the phone is just, you know, if you're lucky, he's in a hotel room and he's maybe making hand motions. But I bet they do. Because they I seem to so. go into it so holistically. Yeah. Like they, It's like being possessed or something. They take it so seriously, yeah. don't they? The, really respecting the, the, the creations and the, and the characters. Yeah. It's like amazing. The problem is you can never talk to them about it because they won't break character. You can't hey. talk to Whitmire. I said at wow. one point, it's like, could I talk to him? Yeah. Not while I'm not on the phone with Kermit. I'd like to talk to Steve. Put put Steve on the phone. But um, and He's like, who's Steve? That's yeah. a figment no, of your that's, imagination. That's not real at all. He doesn't, he doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. It was, but, but the second time, it was a press conference for the, the new Jason Siegel Muppets film. Yeah. They brought Kermit in and Whitmire, but they brought the box in with the puppet and he popped up from behind the table and the 40 people, the, the journalists arranged in this hotel ballroom just instantly became six. You don't question it for <laughs> a second. Mm. And he, I don't know, I still don't know how he does this, but he makes eye contact with the person who's asking him a question when he's answering. Mm. And I have no idea how. There are no cameras I'm underneath. There's no way he can tell. Just he knows where the voice comes from. Maybe, just like but they the experience. locked on. And it was incredible. I mean, I asked a question, a couple of other people did, and... The, and you're talking to Kermit the Frog. It doesn't matter that you know. It doesn't matter that It, it reminds you know. me of something I watched about E.T. and that Drew, Drew Barrymore really believed that E.T. was real. Sure. Well, what was she, and three? She... the actress who, I, I can't remember her name, but the actress who played the mother who's in the howling. Oh, Dee Wallace. Yes. She was saying that, you know, the the puppet had a soul. She was saying, you know, the creature, the, there was something eerie about it that it you felt like it really was alive and it did have its own soul. Mm-hmm. And... I think that there's something really powerful about that, like almost frighteningly powerful. It's like animism or something, yeah. that some sort of spirit enters that that bit of cloth and, yeah. and brings it to life. And It's the Velveteen Rabbit, isn't it? Like if you love it enough, it'll be alive. Yeah. That's what you want for it. Yeah, and as a child, that you, you really believe in that. You believe that your toys do have a soul and have a spirit. And, you know, that's why puppets are so powerful for children Mm -hmm. um because you believe that your teddy is real anyway and the idea of someone you know destroying your teddy is like actual murder yeah there's an amazing um comedian called nina conti i don't know if you would know about her but she um she's a ventriloquist okay and i remember seeing her doing an act and uh, her puppet is very funny because he's like her subconscious and he just tells her everything she's getting wrong and um there was this act that she did where she actually said oh, I'm going going to take your clothes off or something or take your skin off and, and then she was starting to talk as the monkey but without the puppet Okay. and she suddenly just stopped and she said I feel really strange I can't go on and she nearly passed out because yeah. she said she felt so sick the puppet not being on her hand but still enacting the puppet and that, that puppet is very real to her like okay. there is something very powerful <laughs> I think it's like you're pulling out parts of your own psyche and, and giving them... It, you know, it's, it's I suppose it's a bit like Northern Lights, you know, Philip Pullman. It's like 
a part of your soul that you're yeah. wearing outside of yourself. Mm-hmm. And that is very vulnerable. And psychologically, what that does to you is quite scary and powerful, I think. Yeah, There's I've, some sort of voodoo going on there, I'm sure. I've never understood the the alchemy, I suppose, of characters who can... And you've, you've played the same character over and over again mm. in, in different situations. And I, it's fascinating. But yeah, at some point, there must be a transference where mm. you're, you've got this person in your head... And mm. you can find the person and lose the person. But after a while, especially with something that's um, a physical encumbrance, yeah, mm. it would be weird to do it differently, to change anything. Yeah, or for someone to say, it's not real. You're killing off that potential within yourself to to carry on doing that act. Or Yeah, I mean, I suppose acting, I've never really sort of done method acting. But there is something strange that happens when you take on a certain role and and play it for quite a long time you do take on a little piece of that person or or that that side of you becomes enhanced in in yeah. in your life i think like even watching the edit of the film that i'm making at the moment I find myself using lines from the film in real life okay. it's really strange it's like and why am i saying a film line from the film that's really weird it's it sort of inhabits you yeah. And I used to, it is a bit demonic. It's like you have to purge yourself of it afterwards and kind of go, get ye gone, <laughs> next character or next film or whatever. Um, but it takes a while. Is there a ritual? I mean, is there a, <laughs> is there a way that you <laughs> shake stuff off? Yeah. I don't know, really. Probably just having another job and, and having to move on to that, to that thing, I suppose, mm. and just having to clear out your head a little bit. But, you know, there are comedy characters that I come back to. But I, I kind of think most characters that I play are parts of myself anyway. So they're all there. They're mm-hmm. all, it's like the puppets at the end of Labyrinth. They're all still there yeah. should I need them. It's just that you have to put them away yeah. and you <laughs> every don't, so often. Yeah. <laughs> and I imagine it's not as uh, tempting to, to dive back into their embrace, which is a really weird kind of fugue state ending for the film. Mm. I, I, I had forgotten that's how it ends, but it, it feels... Like the kind of thing that Henson would love, mm. rather than Sarah would love. Mm. Like he's he loves these things he's built and yeah. so much, and and now you get to lose yourself in them. And all I can think of is, aren't her parents downstairs? What does, <laughs> what does this? It's a mean? very Muppets show ending, isn't yeah. it? It's like all the crazy characters, and you're like, what? Even the Fireys, they were a nightmare. Yeah. You don't want them back. I had forgotten <laughs> quite how bizarre. <laughs> and, and completely unprovoked that sequence is that there are yeah. these just these there are these puppet birds who are man sized and want to pull your head off. Yeah, and what about you? I mean, I was talking about how spurious I find that ending because as a child, I you know you understand it's all about leaving childhood behind and becoming an adult and becoming sensible and leaving behind your toys and imagination and nostalgia. And to me, that was incredibly sad as a child to watch that. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to put my toys away yet. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't want her to, I don't want the film to end. I don't want the characters to go away. I and and her putting all her stuff away was really sad. But at the same time, I knew that was the ending. I was kind of accepting of it. You know, that's sad, but it's reality. That's what growing up is about. And then when they sort of pop up and go do you want us to come back? And she goes, oh, yeah, go on then. I was a bit like, <laughs> no, no, that's not real. It's a bit like someone telling you that Father Christmas isn't real and then going, but he is really. Right. And you're just like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Come on, he's not. Yeah. But you can't, you can't reverse that. I think if, if you've, <laughs> you know, you've earned that journey. That's the whole point. Like yes. she, has, she has matured and she's yes. discovered things and learned and uh, paid So I for wonder it. it was a bit of a studio or Muppets show. Like, that's not, we can't kill any of the creatures. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got to get them back in, in in some way when really it doesn't really completely make sense yeah. for the character or for the story or for the character arc. But, you know, when I was watching it on TV recently... Um, I did feel really, really sad, and I was rela- relating it to Bowie's death, really, and it of course. kind of gave me a sort of perspective on kind of catharsis about my sadness about Bowie having died, because everybody, you know, has, has their own way that they relate to his music and his work and his death, actually. Um, but it kind of made me realise, you know, he embodied some sort of part of my childhood, but also that I actually 
did think he was like a fantasy figure. I think he'd played so many aliens and creatures and the Goblin King and, you know, that I, in part, some part of my head, thought he was immortal, like Father Christmas. And it was him sort of going away. It did feel like we're all children going, no, we want you to come back. Yeah. We, we don't want you to go away. And it's the end of that film is that it's, it's a goodbye to childhood and, and growing up. And I, I sort of it sort of helped me to understand why it was so sad for me, you know, um, apart from, you know, everything that I've been influenced by him and his work and like so many people have, but but it also made me realise why that film would have that power over me to make me feel so sad about it again, but in, in a nice way, in a good way. Yeah, well, I mean, Jareth, as, as does everyone else, as you say, Jareth survives, but mm. no one is... No one has changed or harmed over the course of the film, which is really interesting, except for Sarah, who grows up. Mm. And you've got just a sad owl Yeah, he off. turns into an owl. It's very classical, that ending. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, there's something, you know, in Ovid, I, I actually studied classics, and I, every now and then I'll dig out an old bit of fact that I have about classics, because I generally don't remember anything <laughs> about my degree. But, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing that would happen in the metamorphoses, that someone will be turned into an animal. Mm-hmm. And that would kind of be their punishment because it takes their voice away, you know. Yeah. And it also means that they don't have memory. It's it's quite an interesting thing that they they only have a very vague memory of who they were. So they're like a ghost, really, which is like a very tragic form to be in. So, for example, if someone got turned into a bird, they'd only be able to say one word, which was connected to who they were when they were human. But right. they're a dumb animal now. They don't really understand have any understanding of themselves. So I think there's kind of all of that tied up in it as well, that you kind of go, okay, he's an owl and he can fly wherever he likes, but at the same time, he can't ever be part of the human world and he can't interact and, oh, it's just very sad. It's a very sort of like his, I suppose he's voiceless as well. He can't speak and can't sing. Dreadful. Yeah, but then then we get the the non-Jareth Bowie over the end credits, and it makes it okay, even though the song is sort of a panic song. Sort of happy, sort of happy song, even though the lyrics are kind of dark. But, um, yeah, again, it's a very sort of, when you dig into it, it's a much darker ending than you remember from Mm -hmm. childhood. Um, And lots of ambiguity to it, I think, because part of me goes, oh, it's a bit like the ending of Brazil, like there's a happy ending... But you know it's not the real yeah. happy ending. There's an alternative, which is the harsh reality. And depending on what sort of person you are, you can choose one or the other. If you're an optimist, you can go, oh, no, that is the actual ending. If you're a pessimist, you're like, no, this is not real. <laughs> this is bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> and, to, and those came out in the same window of time, too, mm, and both yes. produced by the Terrys and created yeah. by Python uh, veterans. It is, like, it's the 80s here, especially, in... in British cinema were such a weird, you know, uh, fertilized place. Mm. Not fertile, but fertilized. That mm. things had already happened, and it was we were seeing it. Ha- we were seeing mm. the results, and it's just this bizarre and studio time productions where, as yeah, well, like and the meaning of life. You mm. know, those those key sequences there where they completely created. It's it's running through it, and I get why. Mike Lee and Ken Loach rose up in Counterpoint in, at that mm. point. Like Loach was making things like Hidden Agenda and Lee was doing um, Life is Sweet right mm. after this, this period of time. Yeah. Almost as a sort of a snapping back against the fantasy. Yeah. But Henson coming here and working, it's like he infected a lot of people. Yeah. And, and pulled them into his world. And he, his, his directorial... Nobody talks about direct... Uh, nobody talks about Jim Henson as a director, as a director because director, you just yeah. don't think about it. Yes. But... What he did with this and what he did with the Dark Crystal and to a lesser extent, even with the Muppet films that he was sort of, I don't think he ever directed any of them, but he produced them very closely. And he was making this strange utopian world for himself Mm. in the workshop where you could make anything. And it's the disregard for mainstream narrative, you know, uh, plotting and and Mm. just grounding everything in, in character and fascination. Yeah. Labyrinth really does feel like the peak of that, where it just it all just kind of fomented and then exploded in this mm. bizarre. I'm doing exactly what I want, and it doesn't yeah, matter if an no one else gets it. Yeah, an approach, I sure. suppose, and and the idea that anyone who was a technician or artist could 
could go to that studio and their imagination would be unleashed. As he said, fertilise that some, some, somehow there was gra- fertile ground to be able to yeah. unleash your imagination and, and someone would pay you to do that as well. I mean, it is incredible and that's very much the, the stuff of my childhood that really inspired me. And it's weird because, you know, sightseers, there's so much... It's much more about realism and, and a lot of the comedy that I've done is about naturalism and realism and it is building on that kind of Ken Loach, Mike Lee tradition. Mm-hmm. But there is also that counterpart point of fantasy and surrealism that I'm really, really interested in and that, as I said, that a lot of the stuff that I write is about someone who aspires to the fantasy but they can't have it. Right. Um, so the pendulum swings back. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think it is about those tensions and it seems a very British thing. You've got Britishness on the one hand, which can be this very creative creative beauty and detail and arts and crafts and Bowie and all, all of this creativity and lush creativity. And then on the other hand, you've got grimy council estates and very grey weather and uh, <laughs> some quite ugly housing. And, you, you know, you have got th- that sort of weird schizophrenia about the British identity, I think. Yeah. Well, you can understand why you would escape into Mm. fantasy and what the appeal of it is. Mm. Um, Especially when, well, I was going to say when there's the threat of a darker world in the real world waiting for you, but Sarah's home is actually pretty nice. She's she's clearly taken care of. Her parents, um, her her parental situation might be a little fraught, but she's a teenager and that's what happens. Mm. You know, like there's, we can't really be sure where the tensions are yeah. coming from. Although the parents are quite funny. I mean, I don't, not to slate them, but they're kind of weird cardboard acting that they're mm. doing of like, well, you come back here, Sarah. It's yeah. all it's all kind of like... Yeah. She sees me as a wicked stepmother. Yes, but no matter what nose. I do, I always... I, I just know so many lines off by heart. <laughs> but, you know, you don't entirely believe that her they're her parents because you're like, why is she so creative? Mm. And I suppose... That's something that's quite interesting is that her mother is obviously the creative one. I think it's said during the film that her mother is an actress. So it's obviously the mother that has infected her with this sort of crazy creativity. And and then her mum and, and her stepmom and dad are just like the norm the normal squares, people. Yeah. They're the squares that are kind of... Which also makes you much more on Jareth's side, I think, as well. Because you're kind of like, yeah, but she's really creative and it's really fine that she goes and you know, recites poetry in the woods. Why shouldn't she, you know? Mm. Why are they trying to stop her doing that? Why are they making her babysit? I mean, part of you goes, well, they've got a point. She's got a point. You know, why Why should she have to look after her brother? Why can't they get babysits her? Yeah. Um, she has that line about how, you know, when, when she's arguing with her stepmother about how you never ask what I want and the stepmother says, you never do anything. Mm. And that seemed really... It's harsh. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite harsh. But also weirdly real like Mm. in a in a in a it's a character beat but it also yeah she's a weird bookish girl who Mm. runs around reciting like she doesn't know she's pretty they don't understand her inner world which is quite tragic really that she's this really creative girl and and they don't understand that and you kind of go she could be doing worse stuff Mm -hmm. she could be going to the park shooting up and having sex with someone on a climbing frame and she's not doing that <laughs> she's just going there wearing a funny medieval dress and reciting poetry you're sort of going they're really getting on her case and she could be a lot worse yeah. I mean five years you know, later she'd be a goth yeah, yeah well five years later she's in bloody requiem for a dream that's true <laughs> oh no few few no, that train few that trains later. a little ways down yeah the but yeah no that's but, true you know, she definitely... could be in a lot worse situation um and Connolly herself had just worked with Argento, so yeah, you know, yeah. she's already seen things. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're kind of going, there's a lot worse things that she could be getting into, and they're really having a go at her. So I think I sort of identify with that as well. It's that kind of Harry Potter thing. Oh. <laughs> Are you joining in? Yeah. Well, Harry so Potter, this... big with kids. <laughs> Sound effects courtesy of my little two-month-old. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's funny. When you mentioned Harry Potter, I remembered that I think this is the first time you hear the word Hogwarts. Oh, really? 
it's uh, I, I, unless it's unless there's an origin of it that I don't know. Oh, it's certainly the first time I was aware of it. J.K. Rowling should be asked to see yes. if she watches it. I mean, I will be tweeting at her constantly. Sometimes she sometimes she responds randomly to people. I think it's <laughs> a shot. Yeah, worth a try. I remember I wanted to do a sketch about. I mean, I've played Bowie a few times in a few different comedy things now. Um, and I remember I wanted to do a series of sketches for Channel 4 and they were sort of saying, this is about 10 years ago, and they were they were sort of saying, oh, we're not sure that Labyrinth... I wanted to play Jareth. Okay. And they were like, we're not sure it's famous enough, we're not sure it's <laughs> mainstream enough. And I sort of had to go off and research the idea of, like, how, how many people have actually seen this film? And the more research I did about it, the more I realised that actually... It was one of the few children's films made at that time, at a time when there was a real lack of children's films. Yeah, things were tilting in the other direction. Disney was getting darker and they, their animation department hadn't really done... I think The Black yeah. Cauldron was the only thing they put out and really? it almost bankrupted them at the time. Mm. Um, also, the you know, one. VHS sort of, you know, I think rentals were at their peak. So even though it didn't do that well in the cinema... Oh, it never it, went away. It was yeah. huge as a, you know, as a... Ooh. Oh dear. Um, you know, it was huge as a rental thing. Well, we were talking about the absence of human performers and, and the fact that you really only have two people to hook onto, and, and one of them, uh, Jareth, is only in it in fits and starts. It's really one character's journey, and Jennifer Connolly is carrying this entire movie because, mm. of course, she's also acting against, you know, latex and felt, mm. which is harder well, than it looks. She does amazingly, and she's such a great actress. You can see how she survived the curse of being a child star yeah, yeah. into into being a very successful adult actress because she is brilliant and you can dress, estimate that as well she'd been slightly annoying the whole film would not have worked yeah. whatsoever or stiff and unconvincing against puppets i mean not everyone can do that but uh, you know she's she's worked with in her teens she's worked with Argento and Henson <laughs> basically back to back which is such a weird starting point it's like you know Natalie Portman working with Luc Besson and then just launching into everybody else. <laughs> there aren't many actors who get to do that. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Polly working with, with Gilliam in mm. Baron Munchausen is the kind of thing where the, the casting is so, it's so fraught. If you mm. get it wrong, your movie doesn't work. Mm. So you have to know, you have to have absolute faith. And then you have to treat this child like a person mm. with and get the performance you want rather than you know, you can't raise your voice, you can't yell it. Uh, Sarah said once that um, uh, in, a, in a conversation with, with Cameron Bailey at TIFF, she said that the thing that Gilliam taught her was that she could listen and respond. Mm. That she didn't simply have to say her lines and wait and say her line. That mm. She could actually interact. And she was just, like, I think, seven yeah, um, it's quite a huge acting that some people don't learn that <laughs> for other Hulk acting yeah, career. Yeah, and Connolly has it too. Like Connolly is actually processing stuff mm. that the puppets are saying to her, yeah. which is kind of incredible. Well, also, it's a very interesting... If she hadn't got maturity, she could well have turned up on that set going, oh, these puppets are actually awful. Yeah. I don't like them. I'm, they're too babyish for me. But the the success of the film rests on her absolutely understanding the story and believing heart and soul in this in in what's at stake basically yeah, i really yeah. i'd love to talk to her about it because i wonder what that experience was like for her i i feel like she totally understood the story and maybe even identified with the character of of having to of loving fantasy it's sort of, it's sort of interesting um metaphor for acting really of sure, like yeah. being in love with a fantasy world and wanting to be part of it but it's it's a poison chalice yeah. to a certain extent um you know because I, I would say like when people say why why do you want to be an actress and people especially when I say oh, I'm, I'm not bothered about fame and stuff like that and people quite often are very skeptical about that they're like of course you want to be famous if you've done this and I I quite genuinely often say I I believed in magic when I was a kid and I just wanted to be part of the magic. Yeah. And, you know, when, I suppose watching something like Labyrinth, I was like, I want to live in that world. I want to live in the fantasy world. And if fantasy doesn't exist, well, the next best thing is being an actor where you could be on stage and pretending that magic is real or pretending that that fantasy does exist. Yeah, it's actually, that's a theory I've, ha I've had for a very long time is that there are two kinds of people who are drawn to acting. One is 
I want to be there. I want to be part of that. That looks like fun. Mm. And then it turns into, I can't imagine not doing this because it's just so much more fun than regular life. Mm. And the other personality is someone who, you know, just desperately wants to not be themselves. Mm. Uh, and so finds out that you can be other people and, mm. that we're, and that they have a talent for it. And there's that weird divide of, of actors who... I mean, I've, I've interviewed dozens of people who have taken this absolutely seriously but still find it pleasurable and fun and, and engage themselves with the process and working with people. And then there's a handful of people who are just, you know, they would be sociopaths if mm. they couldn't do this. <laughs> they need the release. Yeah, exactly. I think there's some directors that are like that as well. <laughs> I think there's some sort of Chinese proverb, and I don't know who it's attributed to, but it's like they said there's two types of actors. There's... There's one actor that you you see them on stage and they're they're pointing at the moon and, and you say, look at that fabulous actor, how amazing they are at pointing at the moon. Mm-hmm. And the other sort of actor, you just go, wow, look at the moon. Yeah. And and I'd rather be that second type of actor that just, you know, it's what you were saying about Sarah Polly and, you know, and Jennifer Connolly, that when an actor is just responding to the other person, then that is somehow much more real and... Well, you believe the puppets are real. You yeah. believe they're characters rather than, you know, armatures and latex and, and remote control faces and all that other stuff. Yeah, and you just forget that they're not real. You absolutely believe that they are, that they're characters. And that, yeah, that's the thing that, we're, you know, when we're talking about what, what, what to talk about in the film, you, I was like, there, there are only two actors. I'd actually forgotten about that. I was like, <laughs> no, surely there must be some more, you know. Hoggle must have appeared in some other films. Yeah. <laughs> But no. No, he was cut out of Glengarry Glen Ross yeah. and it all went downhill for he him had after that. that amazing scene in Goodfellas where he was like <laughs> arguing, you know, and he oh, just see, got cut out and then he got shot. I, and <laughs> yeah, now I want him to be like, get your shine box, now I want that. <laughs> oh, that's not going to happen for all. But it, and yes, we will we will pursue further in any way we can the, uh, the question of whether or not J.K. Rowling stole Hogwarts from a yeah. mispronunciation of Hoggle's name because I just jumped back when I heard that. Really? I think I it as well i want it to be true yeah even if it isn't it Hogwarts. should be Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah why not <laughs> and the, and just the strange pleasure of all those arch line readings of of different you know, malapropisms or, or uh, mm. mondegreens i guess for his name it's it's such a strange film and it keeps revealing new strange things yeah 30 years down the line yeah, that I love that sculpture of bowie's face that when they walk past in it perspective thing yeah, yeah. and uh trying to remember where I saw something like that and, it is, yeah. and went is that inspired by Labyrinth? <laughs> it's certainly possible I mean it's been around long enough that as you say it's like it's permeated into people's cultural creative DNA I mean there's so many bits in it which I think have been you know have been repeated in other films I was thinking about those those rocks that warn people and mm-hmm. go Oh, please let me say it. I haven't said it for such a long time. Oh, and the helping hands. I mean, all of these things that, as you say, the the narrative is really meandering. It's kind of picaresque. It's just episodic, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. like she meets various different creatures. But at the time, I didn't question it at all as a child. And all of those things like the helping hands really stuck in my mind. And I think visually are really incredible. It's, I, you know, I often have this debate when I'm talking about when, when I was about 17, I did uh, an A-level in general studies, which basically is like a free A-level that you get where you don't really study for it, but it's just like, oh, like you can take the paper and it's just testing you to see how stupid you are or how clever you are or whatever. But one of the things that you had to do was write an essay, and I wrote an essay about CGI versus in-camera effects, and oh, okay. I talked about Jurassic Park versus um, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula, (laughs) which I absolutely loved, and I still love it now, but I'm just more aware of how hilarious parts of it are now. (laughs) But I still think it's brilliant. Um, But, you know, someone like Ray Harryhausen, who I also absolutely love all his work, and when I was a kid I didn't even know who he was, I just knew that there was certain animation in certain films that I really, really loved, Mm. and... Yeah, there's a flavour to his stuff that just isn't yeah, present. Yeah, an artistry. I mean, it's like what we were saying of, like, 
you know, who are the artists of CGI? Who are the Jim Hensons of CGI? They must exist, but mm, whether just... they're being championed in the way that they should be, I, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know them because that would break the illusion that anything is possible. You still need one guy to do it or one woman <laughs> at the keyboard to do it. Yeah. And that would probably work against the concept. Yeah, of... and they, they might have too much power then if, the, if you, you know, you realise that some one person's CGI was that much more effective and amazing and imaginative and like a piece of art than someone else then Mm -hmm. you know the studios might actually start to need them instead of going well we could get someone else to do it we could just outsource this to anyone really um which happens anyway mm, yeah i'm sure i mean i don't really know how much about that world but you know i know that the stuff that i've done partly because i've got no budget but i i do really like the in-camera ethos i kind of the film that i've just shot we did pretty much everything in camera with no money Mm. you know but sometimes I think the effects that are produced, and I argued this in my essay that I did when I was 17, is that um, when there's a human touch to it, it's just much more compelling to watch on screen. Um, you know, like the puppets in Alien, the, the, the strangeness, the uncanniness, yeah. is something that's created by there being a human involvement behind the mechanics of it, which gives it a spontaneity and makes it more interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. And on some base level, I think we read the actors knowing that there's something there. Mm. Uh, Sam uh, Worthington has this thing that he learned on Avatar. Uh, Louis Leterrier told me this about Clash of the Titans, that they were going to do a lot of digital monsters. Mm. And Worthington said, look, I need a head. I need mm. an arm. I need a fist. I need something to touch in order to play. And you can make it green and paint it out and it doesn't matter. I just need to see something. I need to feel something. And... Leteria said, yeah, you know what? He was absolutely right. It didn't cost anything. It wasn't a golf ball on a stick. It, we, you know, we, we built statue heads and things that he could okay, look yeah. at. But his body tenses up and his arms move a certain way. His muscles group. And you believe it when you see it. You believe mm-hmm. that there is a griffin or medusa or whatever it is. is it's actually happening. Yeah. I mean, it's like when you do theatre. I, I love theatre and I don't do it very much. But I sort of started out in um, physical theatre and um, doing sort of devised physical theatre shows, very much influenced by Robert Lepage and, oh, yeah. and Complicité and all these theatre companies. Um, and, you know, the idea would be that you know, you'd get a dustbin or something and pretend that it's an astronaut's space lock, you know, right. airlock on, on an aeroplane or something. And, you know, part of the joy of that is projecting yourself to the point where you do believe that it's an airlock on a spaceship and that's some of the joy of it but you do need that dustbin <laughs> yes. to be there yeah no, I know what you, you know mean. whereas when it's absolutely nothing you're just that's mine then which you feel sort of faintly ridiculous yeah, doing it's, it's beneath us <laughs> well also when it's on camera you're sort of like really you really want to test my mime skills to this point it's always the thing that i have like this dilemma in auditions where you might audition for something quite big you know a big film and in in the script it says she leans over and kisses him then puts the gun to his head and you're like do you want me to do this <laughs> do you want me to mime this it's always a bit of a conflict and it's mm-hmm. you feel like you know what would De Niro do would he just mime it would he mime sticking his tongue in a woman's mouth and then putting a gun to her head or something no one teaches you this stuff I don't know I didn't go to drama school so maybe they do teach you that stuff in drama school but I'm always like oh it's so agonising I think if you're an amazingly confident actor they would they would just mime it they'd just and they'd carry it off and I've got a lot of admiration for those types of actors but that is essentially I mean, I also think it's the boredom involved. Like, when you're shooting something that's so huge and epic that you're just getting a a tiny few amounts of seconds in a day and it's all green screen. Like, you know, Peter Jackson was talking about doing um, the Hobbit trilogy and sort of saying, we're making it up as we go along. And you look at, you know, where the actors are actually acting. Just a big green room with maybe a couple of pillars made yeah. out of polystyrene or something and you kind of go and, and they're probably getting a tiny bit of footage every day and I just think the boredom might set in it's yeah. not just well look at the Star Wars prequels I mean those were shot the same way and you can tell the actors are just exhausted and, and, mm. and yeah cranky. spent a week in a green room going and when are we going to do that bit where I have to <laughs> you know okay we'll do it when again. do I get to <laughs> act 
Maybe yeah. I get to do something. I mean, I, I was working with um, Martin Freeman on, on a film ages ago, and I was like, gosh, you know, I'm not used to working on films with this budget. It wasn't a massive budget film, but it was bigger than I was used to. And I was like, you know, the waiting around, it's, you know, it's really different to low budget. You know, the joy of low budget is that you... Sometimes you only get one take, mm-hmm. and it's much more like a bit of theatre. It's like, ah, you got to do it. More often than not, you get it right, and you give something a little bit more than you even thought you were going to give because you only get that one chance. Yeah, you're not holding anything back. Yeah, exactly, and you're you're thinking, well, I've, I've got to make a fool of myself. This is my only chance. I've just got to go for it. I'm like, wow, I did something I wasn't expecting there, and mm-hmm. that's on camera. And he was like... Um, I said, oh, was, was it like this on The Hobbit? And he said, it was much slower than this on The <laughs> Hobbit. <laughs> I was like, really? I don't know if I could be an actor on big budget stuff. Yeah. I don't. It sounds I mean, absolutely terrifying. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a, there's a, I guess there's a sort of a, a, a sense of safety in knowing that you can do, you can do it again or you can fix it in post. Um, but maybe that's bad safety. I think so. It might be bad safety. Yeah, I think it means <laughs> we'll you never really <laughs> fully commit, or, yeah. or you know you don't have to. You some part of you holds back. Uh, I mean, not to not that digital effects are are always bad. I, I was thinking of um, Simon Pegg told me that the the most fun he had in the volume, mm. uh, the most fun he had working in motion capture was making Tintin mm. with Spielberg because oh, really? yeah, he and Frost were just. Bouncing, literally bouncing off of each other wearing yeah. these purple suits and just enjoying themselves in a big empty room and you could do whatever you wanted. Yeah. But also he knew they were also the supporting characters and so they didn't need to be the center. They could they could they just could play. Do what they liked. Yeah, yeah. They were allowed. Yeah. And the absolute nothingness was liberating because they would you know, if well, there was something in the way it would be removed. Yeah, maybe it's when it's half halfway, when you're sort of constricted halfway by going, There is a giant ape in front of you hmm. and you're on a really tall tower. So you can only move this amount and you can only do this but do whatever you like within that. Yeah. Yeah, no <laughs> restrictions that's, that's restrictions the create thing that art. Makes it harder. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe mean, it. it terrifies me, the thought of, of doing all that stuff. But, you know, one day I might have to do it, so... <laughs> well, you've got friends you can ask questions about. You'll be, <laughs> yeah. You can you have resources yeah, available exactly. to you. Uh, and then the final question of the of the show is always the same, which is... And I think you've, we've touched on it a little bit, because that's starting to happen more and more now when I do these. Um, what is What of Labyrinth have you personally absorbed or lifted or quoted or just outright stolen is there anything that in your work that reaches to it um well uh there's a journalist friend of mine um who wrote a very brilliant article about the effects of a labyrinth on her and on her psyche her name's sophie mayer oh i'll have to find it of course um she wrote a brilliant article about um you know as we were saying like it can be quite a bad role model. If you happen to fall in love with Jareth the Goblin King, you might be searching for that person for the rest of your life and having really disastrous relationships with men with really dodgy mullets and mm-hmm. sort of commitment issues and who live in a fantasy world. Yeah. So that's a disaster. But there is a line at the end, which is, you have no power over me, which is the text that she's reading from at the beginning, which is called The Labyrinth. And then she realises the true power of those words. She never really understood them at the beginning. By the end, she understands them. And that line, I think, is really interesting. And and my journalist friend wrote it as sort of a female empowerment line. Sure. And and it's true, because I have thought that myself in the past when I've worked with people that I've felt like... I think, especially working in comedy, the era that I was working in comedy, which was a time, you know, sort of nearly 20 years ago now, where there weren't that many women in comedy in the British comedy scene. And so I felt like I was in a world where I was, like, some often, like more often than not, the only woman in the immediate environment that yeah. I was working in. And it made, quite often, because I didn't start out in comedy, I would feel like I didn't know what I was doing. And that people around me would quite often be saying, no, that's wrong, that's not how you do it, no, you can't do this, you can't do that, no, that won't work, blah, 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 all this stuff. And and it took me a long, long time to sort of realise that my ideas had validity, that it was okay to call myself a writer, that it was okay to want to write stuff or have control over stuff. It, it was like, you know, when I started making stuff, the people who told me that my ideas were bad 
would be coming to me going, that was quite good what you did. Right. And I'd be realising, oh my God, I could have been doing this stuff years ago, but you made me feel like it was rubbish. So I never did it. And just that line, you have no power over me, is something that I kind of go, oh yeah, this, this point at which you realise that people don't have to have power over you, that you've sort of allowed them to have power over you and you've been waiting for some sort of permission to be allowed to do creatively what you want to do. And then you realise nobody has to give me permission. I can actually do whatever I want. And I think that line, you have no power over me, has got quite a lot of power to it. I think it's that's something that I've taken from it. I wonder if people are getting it tattooed now. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great mantra. Within a crystal, with oh, Bowie right. holding it. That oh, would be yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, it is a great mantra. And I think a lot of the films that I'm writing, or that I would like to write, have a similar arc as I was saying like someone who has dreams of fantasy and they are destroyed by reality I think a lot of my stuff echoes those that theme mm. so it's the creator pushing back yeah, I mean, you, get to, or, or, you get to have the, the, the validation of watching someone aspire and fail because you've actually triumphed <laughs> by making the story yeah I guess so I hadn't really thought of it in that way <laughs> I I uh, uh, um script editor that I worked with said to me that all of your stories are about empowerment which I thought was really interesting because it's that sort of transformation thing but mm -hmm. I think that's also why I love Bowie so much and that so many people do but you know this power to be whatever it is you want to be and that you're you can do what you want you know it's part of the reason why I directed my film is sort of like why the hell not why shouldn't I want to be in control of every aspect of what I do creatively. There's so many people that would tell you like, oh, are you sure you can do that? Can you cope with it? Or, you know, are you being sort of creatively monopolizing? <laughs> you know, don't you need other people helping you to make it good or whatever? And I think that, yeah, he is someone that made you feel like you could achieve your dreams, you could do what you wanted. And that's sort of what that happens in Labyrinth as well. She sort of achieves her dreams and then throws them away, <laughs> bizarrely, and goes and gets a job as an accountant, maybe, we can only presume. I kind of um, want... Yeah. <laughs> See, now I want the sequel. I want I want to follow her home. Mm. Like she works in a regular job and she's boring and she goes home and all of the creatures are still there. <laughs> and she really wishes they would go because she wants a relationship <sighs> and she just lives with loads of Muppets. I mean, that's kind of Drop Dead Fred, though, isn't it? Which a is another bit, really yeah. interesting film about growing up and adulthood and I think a lot of my films are about growing up as well even though I'm like God, I'm getting a bit old to tell that story but maybe yeah. not our generation no, <laughs> I think it's they an really evergreen. struggle yeah. they struggle to grow up I'm told 50 is the new 35 and I'm clinging to it <laughs> oh I like the sound of that that's great that makes me about 21 I think <laughs> yeah. I've got ages it's fine I've got ages to go <laughs> My thanks to Alice Lowe, who will be in Toronto for the North American premiere of Prevenge on Monday, September 12th at 7.15pm at the Hot Dog Cinema. There are two other screenings scheduled at TIFF, Wednesday, September 14th at 9.15pm and Saturday, September 17th at 6.15pm, both at the Scotiabank 8. If you're in town, check one of those out. The movie is creepy and funny and, and weirdly English in just the right way. You can keep an eye out for Prevenge by following Alice on Twitter at Alice Lowe, all one word, and you can find Labyrinth on DVD and Blu-ray from Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. In fact, there's a 30th anniversary remastered edition arriving on Blu-ray and 4K Blu-ray later this month with new special features, but it's also available for sale and rental right now, and you can find it on iTunes and Google Play. Come on, though. You want this on your shelf. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com. You can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at SomeoneElsesMovie.com. If you want to leave a review on iTunes, that would be very kind of you. This week's call sign is, I Moved the Stars for No One. Thanks for listening. I'm afraid you just too darn loud.